Welcome to our panel session today on federal funding for resilient cities. I'm Steve Kraut, Director of Policy and Resilience Programs at the Smart Cities Council, and I will serve as your host today. I have been fortunate to serve as project manager for the groundbreaking Readiness for Resilience Program that serves to help communities impacted by natural disaster build a resilience roadmap forward so that they are better prepared for, better able to respond to, and better able to recover from future storms. This is a multi-stakeholder process, including government, industry, academia, and the nonprofit community. Like so many public-private partnerships, we are always looking for funding options to continue our work. We thought it would be particularly important for city and community leaders attending this conference to hear directly from the key federal agencies that provide hazard mitigation funding. In fact, FEMA just announced a new program that will provide $500 million in pre-mitigation assistance grants to communities under the Building Resilience Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC. Today, we have an incredible lineup of speakers from FEMA and HUD, who all participated in a recent webinar on these federal grant opportunities and the relevant cost share requirements. I also had the privilege of participating in this webinar, and I thought it would be an important opportunity to replay this video here. But first, we will hear from special guest Pamela Williams, who serves as Executive Director of the Build Strong Coalition. Pamela and her coalition have been leaders in the push to dedicate more federal resources to pre-mitigation activities and to ensure that redevelopment funds can be used to apply today's best practices rather than simply rebuilding as is. Pamela, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so very much, Steve. Let's get started. First, let me tell you just a little bit about the Build Strong Coalition, which I represent, and why we're so excited to be here to help build capacity and capability for investing in disaster mitigation. You see, communities have the opportunity to leverage creative partnerships to help meet the cost share requirements of FEMA's hazard mitigation grants and to obtain even more resources needed to drive disaster resilience. The Build Strong Coalition was actually formed in 2011 in response to the ever-increasing number of severe disasters. And we are made up of a tremendously diverse group of members, including firefighters, emergency responders, emergency managers, insurers, engineers, architects, contractors, and manufacturers, as well as consumer organizations such as code specialists, and the many, many others that are committed to building a more disaster resilient nation. We do know that by bringing these voices and stakeholders to the table, it was critical to driving a national policy discussion on how we drive down the ever increasing trajectory of disaster costs and losses. Particularly in the wake of the 2017 disaster season, by leveraging the input of our members data, as well as diverse perspectives, and engaging with all levels of government, the private sector, and nonprofit entities, we have been able to significantly transform the federal framework focused on investments in mitigation. And this culminated in the passage of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018, which FEMA has taken and leveraged their new authorities to invest in their mitigation programs, make the necessary adjustments, and they've even launched the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, or BRIC, grant program to help drive more significant, effective, and consistent investments in mitigation. It is such a privilege to be here today with the Smart Cities Council for Smart Cities Week to help frame this conversation, which really does illustrate how critical it is to cultivate partners, stakeholders, and alliances to help identify, design, facilitate, fund, truly transformational mitigation, and achieve community resilience. Thanks in large part to the efforts of the resilience community, FEMA has seen a dramatic increase in hazard mitigation funding, particularly in pre-disaster mitigation. But what do we know? 
The federal funding alone will certainly not cover the costs of the investments needed to significantly draw down disaster risk. Further, as you're about to hear in detail, FEMA's hazard mitigation programs require that grant recipients have some skin in the game, if you will, and share in the cost of mitigation projects and investments. So while FEMA's programs generally involve 75% federal cost share and 25% non-federal cost shares, I do hear from communities quite frequently about how they're going to face the challenges of coming up with their cost share as well as how they can leverage these investments to accomplish innovative, strategic, and integrated projects in their community. But wait, because you're about to hear that communities actually have a considerable amount of flexibility in how they obtain the resources they need for the non-federal match. Whether it's from applicants or sub-applicants, property owners, insurance, other federal agencies, and third parties, it can take the form of cash, donated goods, um, third party, in-kind services, labor, materials, and any combination. And FEMA wants you to be creative and innovative. FEMA wants you to develop, engage, and leverage these creative partnerships with groups just like the Smart Cities Council and the Build Strong Coalition. So please join me as we launch into this exciting and informative conversation where you're gonna hear from the experts and program managers of each of FEMA's hazard mitigation assistance programs, including the new BRIC program. Then we're gonna to respond to your questions and hear some very specific examples and best practices for how you can leverage multiple lines of funding and partnerships to help build resilient communities, which ultimately save lives and livelihoods. Let's get started. Good day and welcome to the Cost Share webinar. My name is Alex Chatello and I'm providing some housekeeping information for today's webinar. Today's session is on Adobe Connect. Therefore, to reduce any technical issues with the audio, please mute your microphone and turn your speakers on. You can find those controls along the top of your screen. Further, if, you're, if you are on a VPN, we recommend that you use Wi-Fi only for this webinar. Note that if you are having any technical issues, please leverage the technical questions pod or email us at fema-hmacomcomms at fema.dhs.gov. This cost share webinar session is 90 minutes. The first hour is in presentation format and the second half hour is a prepared panel discussion. We will not have an open Q&A session today. Lastly, on Adobe Connect, we have files for download in the file download pod and links to your use on the left-hand side of your screen. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Kaya Lakia, Deputy Director of HMA at FEMA. Alex, thank you for the introduction and yes, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kayad Lakia. I'm the Deputy Director of Hazard Mitigation at FEMA. And we are here today to discuss the HMA cost share requirements and partnership opportunities relative to the HMA division and its respective grant programs, which include the Flood Mitigation Assistance, or the FMA program, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, or HMGP, and the Building Resilient Infrastructures and Communities, BRIC program. I am joined today by the program chiefs for each of these three programs, Brandon Sweezer, who heads up the FMA program, Anna Pudlow, who heads up the HMGP program, and Camille Crane, who runs the BRIC program. Each of them will speak towards the various cost share requirements and opportunities relative to each of the respective programs. Following the presentation and some additional discussion on the sources and types of eligible cost share funds, we will hear from three of our HMA division partners who will share their experiences with HMA cost share and share some of their insights with you. Our partner presenters include Marty Chester, who is our lead grants management specialist in region six, 
Clay Lloyd, who is the HUD Disaster Recovery and Special Issues Division Specialist. And finally, Steve Kraut, Director of Policy and Resiliency Programs at City Tech Strategy Group. Thank you, the three of you, for joining us today. Before we get started with today's agenda, I want to provide a few reminders and helpful tips. Uh, please uh, remember that FEMA does not endorse any non-government entities, organizations, products, or services. Uh, second, as a reminder, located on the left side of the screen is a resource pod that includes related documents for download. And lastly, please double check that you are muted during today's webinar and partner presentations. Our presenters will speak for approximately an hour, and upon the completion of the presentations, Ryan Janda, who is my non-disaster mitigation program brand chief, will lead a facilitated question and answer session where speakers will answer questions. Should call participants have questions, I encourage you to please submit them through the Q&A pod. We won't have time to get through these today, but I can assure you that we will capture these questions and provide responses as appropriate. <clears throat> so, as the leadership team for the HMA division, I oversee efforts to reduce nationwide vulnerability to disasters and natural hazards by increasing community resilience through efficient and effective hazard mitigation grant programs and resources. All the funding opportunities that HMA oversees are helping to build a more resilient nation under FEMA strategic plan and which aims to create a shared vision for the field of emergency management and sets an ambitious path forward to unify and further professionalize emergency management across the country. Today's session will focus on the cost share requirements in the context of three HMA grant programs that I identified at the top of this presentation and are highlighted in the 2015 HMA cost share guide with the exception of the BRIC program, which has replaced the PDM, the pre-disaster mitigation grant program, and it has been identified in the guide as such. Each of these HMA grant programs requires some percent of eligible project activities to be funded via cost share, and the cost share is a statutory requirement pursuant to Title II of the Code of Federal Regulations. More broadly, HMA grant programs cost share obligations are dependent upon the grant programs being applied for, a community's demographics, the type and scope of the project submitted by the applicant, and the partnerships identified and established as part of the project activities. So let us get started. What is cost share? Cost share is a portion of the cost of a federally assisted project or program borne by the federal government or a non-federal government entity. And FEMA cost share contributions start at 75% and cover up to 100% of eligible project cost under certain communities and property conditions. We will talk more about uh, how this relates to the three HMA grant programs. What is an in-kind contribution? An in-kind contribution is non-cash donations provided by non-federal third parties, and these can be in the form of real property, equipment, supplies, services, and other expendable property. We will, we will speak more about the various sources and types of in-kind contributions later on in this presentation and how they can be combined to fulfill the 25% non-government cost share requirement. Additionally, it is important to note that in general, federal funds may not be used to cover the 25% cost share requirement for non-federal entities. This is in order to avoid duplication of benefits which is defined as a situation when assistance from more than one federal source is used for the same purpose or activity. Uh, however, there are certain circumstances where federal funds may be applied toward the 25% cost share. These allowable funds lose their federal identity at the state level. We will cover more of the eligible sources of federally awarded cost share funds later in this presentation. Next slide, please. So an important benefit of HMA cost share requirement is the ability to organize and build public-private partnerships that enhance project outcomes. FEMA wants to help encourage and support stakeholders in partnering with new types of organizations and establishing lines of communication where none have existed previously. 
For the HMA division, partners often act as one, champions who spread our message and promote mitigation projects in our communities, two, service providers at all levels who can provide technical expertise in mitigation and opportunities for donated cost share dollars or resources, and lastly, connectors to other sources of funding that can be leveraged for cost share. Several examples of partnerships activities are included on the slide and may be pursued at the applicant or the sub-applicant level to support partnership building efforts or may be provided by sub-applicants to enhance the capabilities of communities to develop and sustain partnerships. Next slide, please. FEMA recommends that all applicants All applicants, sub-applicants, and or community officials coordinate early in order to address cost share requirements and all programmatic requirements. The identification of a cost share source is a major consideration in the application process, and a potentially eligible project deemed to meet programmatic requirements may not be viable if the cost share requirements cannot be met. As part of their application, an applicant should describe the extent of its partnerships, including cost share contributions, multi-jurisdictional projects, etc. The example graphic on the slide illustrates the various phases during which partners, both government and non-government, can get involved in the project identification and application cycles. Our next guest, uh, Brandon Sweezer, as I mentioned, he's the chief for the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, FMA, and Brandon has extensive experience dealing with cost share requirements for the FMA programs. And with that, I will turn it over to Brandon, but not before saying thank you to each and every one of you for your interest in this program, as well as your participation in today's webinar. Thank you all. Hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Suiza. I'm the Executive Chief for the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. <laughs> the purpose of the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program is to provide funds to mitigate um, properties and communities that uh, have insurance or are participating in the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, funds that are from policyholders fund our mitigation efforts through FMA, so we are always looking to mitigate properties that are um, insured under the program as well as subject to repetitive flood loss. We provide funds to states, territories, federally recognized tribes, and communities that are insured under the NFIP. And we have some unique cost shares that are associated with the NFIP depending on um, whether or not your uh, property in, your in the application would be subject to repetitive loss. So generally, um, most programs under HMA do have a FEMA 75% uh, federal share and a non-federal share requirement of 25%. Under FMA, this includes the bulk of a lot of our projects, which include our individual property flood mitigation efforts, which include elevation, acquisition, relocation, and reconstruction of individual properties. And these are properties that are not considered to be severe repetitive loss structures or repetitive loss, and I'll get into those definitions in a moment. We also fund project scoping for future um, uh, project sub applications that may be submitted. And this can be looked at as seed funding for future activities that can be submitted, not just under the FMA program, but under any other of our mitigation programs. We also allow for uh, funding for community flood mitigation projects, and these are localized flood control projects. So think of uh, stormwater management or floodplain restoration projects that impact a, a larger area within your community uh, on the drainage um, basin level. We also fund the flood mitigation plan, so not the entire hazard mitigation plan, but those portions that involve um, the flood hazard plan um, portion of the hazard mitigation plans. And then we also do provide some technical assistance. And all of these activities, again, are um, funded under the 75% FEMA cost share. Uh, moving on, we have the 90% cost share, which is extended out to our repetitive loss property. Now, repetitive loss properties, as defined under the um, under FMA, are structures that have incurred flood-related damage on at least two occasions 
and which the cost of repair on average equals or exceeds 25% of the market value of the structure. And so for those properties that are determined to be eligible and selected under the program, the cost share is enhanced and we will provide up to 90% funding for that. Um, our, that moves on to the next um, cost share that we have, which is a 100% federal cost share. So there is no cost match required and that's for properties that are determined to be uh, severe repetitive loss. And we have two definitions for severe repetitive loss um, for which um, four, if they have four or more separate NFIP claim payments, this includes building and contents that have been made under um, the flood insurance claim and the amount of each claim exceeds uh, $5,000 and the cumulative amount of such claims exceeds $20,000. Or um, the other definition that we have for SRL as well is for which at least two separate claim payments have been received and those um, exceed the current, uh, the market value of the insured structure. So if a structure that has NFIP coverage does meet one of those definitions under SRL, then they would be eligible for up to a 100% uh, federal share from the FMA program. Just a few notes in terms of eligibility for FMA. You, the community as well as the state have, must have a uh, approved FEMA um, hazard mitigation plan. And for all the communities that come in as sub-applicants, they must be um, a participating community in the NFIP for which we have about 20,000 NFIP communities uh, across the nation. The application period generally opens around the same time every year in September and closes in uh, late January. Um, if you have any questions regarding the FMA program, the Notice of Funding Opportunity for Fiscal Year 2020 is available on FEMA.gov. With that, I'm gonna turn it over um, to Anna Pudlow with uh, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Hey, Anna, you'll need to unmute, please. Thank you uh, for that reminder. Brandon, thank you for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Anna Pudlow, and I am the Section Chief of the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Today, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Global Match, which is a big asset in the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. When using Global Match, the non-federal cost share does not need to be 25% for each individual project. Rather, it needs to meet the entire disaster cost. This provides greater flexibility within the disaster. Global Match increases the flexibility for applications to share those cost, methods, cost share methods. Non-federal cost share can come from a variety of sources, including cash or donated resources for eligible project costs from the applicant, sub-applicants, or mitigation recipients. The applicant administers the program and has discretion to implement Global Match. However, HMDP Global Match is also under uh, certain review requirements uh, as for applying. It has to meet environmental review, planning requirements, uh, cost effectiveness, um, and all eligible costs. Uh, steps related to Global Match can be found in our HMA cost share guide in, and additional benefits and considerations in the key requirements. I'll now be passing things over to Camille Crane We'll be talking about cost share requirements for the BRIC program. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, so once again, my name is Camille Crane. I'm Section Chief for the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Program. So as you've heard from both Brandon and Anna, we do have cost share requirements in BRIC as well. And generally, they are 75%, up to 75% FEMA or federal, and then there is a 25% non-federal cost share assigned. We do have a couple of different differences. The biggest one, um, as it relates to our project sub-applications, is for small and impoverished communities. So communities that can show documentation that they meet the requirements of small and impoverished can, achieve, can receive up to 90% um, FEMA or federal cost share and then provide the 10% um, non-federal cost share. So what does it mean to be a small impoverished community? You'll see there on the slide that has two basic um, metrics or requirements. The first is the population. 
So it's a community of 3,000 or fewer individuals identified as a rural community and not a remote area within a corporate boundary of a larger city. And then the second, it has to show that it's economically disadvantaged. And we define that by saying that it can show that with residents having an average per capita annual income not exceeding 80% of the national per capita income. So if a community wants to apply for that 90-10 cost share, so 90% federal, 10% non-federal, um, they must submit documentation um, in their sub-application that, that shows that they can meet these two requirements. And then that, when that sub-application gets, or sub-application gets to the applicant as part of their review, the applicant will review that and it agree for that to FEMA, who will then do a review of it as well. If for any reason um, the documentation is not complete or cannot be some, um, substantiated, the cost share will revert back to 75% federal, 25% non-federal. Um, one other cost share difference we have that's not on this slide, but I did want to mention, is as it relates to our management costs. So management costs are those costs that can be incurred um, to manage the grant or manage the award, including doing quarterly report and things like that. Um, and that has a 100% federal share. So there is no cost share requirement for management costs. Inside of the BRIC program, management costs are capped at 5% for sub-applicants, and it's a line item they put in their sub-application for management costs. And then for the applicant, there is a 10%. Um, they can put in 10% for the total cost of their applications, and it's a separate sub-application they fill out and FEMA go. As Brandon mentioned, um, just like with FMA, BRIC is currently in its open application period, um, and you can find out more information about BRIC at our website at www.fema.gov forward slash BRIC, including our notice of funding opportunity. So now that we've talked a little bit about the cost share for each of those of our three mitigation programs, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about, okay, so I've got this, for example, 25% non-federal cost share. What does that mean or what can that be made up of? Um, one thing we want to remind people is it, it can definitely be cash, but it doesn't have to be cash. And so that was one of the whole points of us having this webinar today. So I'm going to go through um, some of the different categories of ways you can come up with um, the non-federal cost share. So I'm going to start with cash. Um, cash, though, can mean cash from a lot of different places or a lot of different ways. So it could be cash either by the applicant or the sub-applicant, just straight cash, dollars provided. Um, it could also be cash that may be um, given by another organization or um, a, like, for example, someone who's benefiting from the project. So as an example, you might have, if you're mitigating a residential structure, maybe the property owners are going to help put up some of that cash. Or if you're mitigating a business, will that, um, that business owner donate some of the cash. Cash can also look like forced account labor. So as the sub-applicant might have staff that is helping to implement the project, maybe they're public works or they're someone from the legal team, but there's staff that are actually going to be completing some of the tasks associated with the project, they can then, you can actually write their time, it has a dollar value, and that can also be included as cash. Um, to meet the non-federal cost share. Then you've also got donated resources. So that's the, the next kind of um, grouping of, of sources of cost share I'll go into. So this might look like donated services or materials from um, a, a nonprofit or a, an outside agency or outside organization. So maybe it looks like um, if you're doing like a property acquisition, it might look like uh, appraisal. Maybe an appraiser is going to donate their services. Um, if you're doing construction, maybe you've got an engineering firm who's going to donate some of their services. But do you have basically any time, if any hours that are spent in uh, from people <laughs> actually completing the work, those hours all have value. And if they are donating those, 
you look at what those value, those dollars are, and that can be part of your non-federal cost share. Um, I would also say that then there's the third one of increased cost of compliance. So, incre or ICC funds, which you may have heard of, increased cost of compliance um, really falls with the uh, NFIP, uh, National Flood Insurance Policy, and it's a, a rider or, or that's in the policy that basically can give up to $30,000 um, to complete um, if there's an increased cost of compliance need. Um, really, you'll see this most come about, I think um, Brandon would agree, in the FMA program. Um, and so you'll see a little bit of language there on the slide um, about some of the specifics about being able to use ICC funds. Um, there are different, very specific uses of, of ways that it can be um, and show up in a mitigation project, um, and there are only certain ways in which it can be um, activated, so to speak. Um, and once again, don't forget that in the file download um, pod on your screen, you can get a copy of the presentation, so you can get all this language that's on these slides. Now, those are some different ways that um, the non-federal cost share can be made up that's inside the community, including cash, donated resources, and ICC funds, as I said. There are also, though, um, we've talked about that it is non-federal cost share, but there are some federal funds that lose their federal identity at the state level, for example, and you'll see some of those listed um, over on the right-hand side of this slide. So one of them is there's certain government loan programs that are managed by um, SBA, Small Business Administration, the USDA, um, or EPA that can be included. One of the keys is if you're thinking about or you, you have access to any of these different funding sources, you want to double check their authority because they will clearly be able to state if they can be used as um, non-federal cost share or match with federal funds. But these are some examples, and I'm very excited that we have Clay with us on today, who's gonna to be able to give more detail on some of the, um, some of the funds that are in HUD, um, including, as one you can see here, the Community Development Block Grant, which has the ability to be used as non-federal cost share. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a hypothetical situation and give um, an example of how these might show up. And one of the things I really want to stress here with this example is you can see that with all the different sources that there are of non-federal cost share, they can be packaged together. So you don't have to just choose all of them. When you're identifying the ways to make up that 25% non-federal cost share, you don't have to say, oh, the entire 25% has to come from one source. So this, will, this example will show you different ways to package different um, sources into uh, making up that entire 25%. So in the example you see on your screen, you have that this is a single property acquisition. Um, so they're gonna purchase a property and return it to green space or open space and deed restrict it. And they're applying to the hazard mitigation grant program. So um, the hazard mitigation grant program, just like BRIC um, and just like uh, non repetitive loss structures for SMA is 75.25. So the total cost to do this acquisition and demolition project is $114,000. So they've applied a 75% federal cost share, so the FEMA portion. So the 75% federal cost share is $85,500. So they're left with 25% or $28,500. Now you'll see how they've packaged three different vehicles are three different um, sources to make up that 28,500, which is 25%. So first off, they're gonna have some donated in-kind labor from a third party and the sub-applicant. And that totals $14,000. For example, how that might show up in an acquisition is maybe they've got um, a crew that's gonna come and do the demolition of the property. They've got a landfill that's gonna donate to be able to take the, the materials they may have an attorney that's gonna do the closing cost, or they're gonna have an appraiser who's gonna donate the um, appraisal. But different, different sources are donating um, their, their, 
their time or their resources to make up um, $14,000 worth of those eligible line items. And that is something really important to mention, is when you look at people donating their time and resources, it has to be um, in, in getting the project actually done. So it has to be eligible line items. They would have been something you could have gotten FEMA reimbursement for, and they have to be you know, necessary to be able to complete the project. Moving on, they're also in this project getting $10,000 from the applicant. So let's say in this example, this was um, a city putting forward the application, and the state is their applicant. In this case, the state is going to de donate $10,000 from this. And then the balance, $4,500, is coming from the property owner. So that's cash that the property owner is donating to be able to complete this um, acquisition demolition. So this is just a, a simple example we wanted to be able to show to see how different types of resources could be packaged together to make up the cost share. So what I'm going to do now, I'm very excited that I have the opportunity to introduce um, someone I've had the pleasure to work with for a few years, and that's Marty Chester from FEMA Region 6, who is a lead grants management specialist. And he's going to be able to walk through some very specific examples of how he has seen cost share play out with some of the grants that he's managed. So Marty, I turn the floor over to you. Hey, thank you so much, Ms. Camille. And thank you guys for joining us on this call today. Uh, I am going to go over a couple examples of how this looks like in real life, in, in, real, in, in practice. I'm going to go over two examples of common um, activity types that we that we see in kind utilized for. Uh, the first I'm going to talk about is a local drainage improvement, a drainage project. Uh, the photo on your screen is, is, is actually the project I'm going to talk about. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, there, there's a two-lane road. Uh, that road re leads to businesses and residential properties. On the right-hand side is the current drainage um, channel. Whenever the community or this area gets moderate to high uh, rain events, the water overflows the banks of this uh, of this uh, of this channel. The water overflows onto the road. Uh, it impedes traffic. It also once the water settles, uh, that leaves debris uh, behind. So it's an, uh, an egress issue. Uh, it also is a challenge for the local community because every time it rains really hard, they have to send crews out to clean the road. Uh, so it's it's um, it, it serves a lot of different issues, but the main thing is the egress issue. The the photo on your on the right hand side is is just a, a blown out view of the area. The ongoing project, to give a little background on it in, in context, uh, the background uh, on this one is the current project includes the expansion and realignment of the existing drain channels. It's going to greatly reduce the flow velocity of the 100-year discharge. In, in, in layman's terms, when it rains real hard, it's not going to flow the, the banks. And like I just mentioned before, it's, it's also going to help prevent uh, stormwater from overtopping the banks. Uh, eliminate the inundation of private property and structures. Uh, eliminate uh, the water over top and going onto the uh, the road and have the, the city uh, community have to come back and clean up over and over again. But it's also going to remove uh, m remove the channel, the drainage channel, uh, from encroaching on private properties. So what does that look like? How how is that going to work? So during the engineering and um, design phase, the blue line is now the new uh, drainage channel. Uh, you can see where the old one is currently and where the new one's going to going to be. I do want to point out the darker black lines are increased support. It's further hardening those key areas that are prone to failure and overtopping. So by putting a little effort, a little bit more into it now uh, during those heavy, heavy rain events, this is to uh, further strengthen and uh, ensure that the, there's not going to be a bank failure over topping. So it went from the straight line, now we've got more of a curved line, which is going to greatly improve the, the outflow and the drainage in this area and prevent the water from going over and inundating the road. Now let's talk a little bit about budgets and cost share, because that's, that's why we're here. 
uh, a quick overview. This is like we talked about prior. This is a, um, a, a HMA grant, which is 75% federal and 25% non-federal. What that actually came out to is $142,546 that the local jurisdiction is going to be responsible for. So in working with the local jurisdiction, we looked at, okay, well, what in, in services that the community jurisdiction has in-house that can be utilized to help offset some of those costs? Like we've been talking about, can we use the, the resources that's already available? So we looked at the budget. Now, in this case, the budget has got four overarching activities. We have the, the permitting, which includes design, drawings, engineering, the actual construction of the project itself. Of course, we need to have some inspections and certifications to make sure it, it met design requirements. And then finally, we got project management and, of course, grant management. So when we sit down and we talk with the local jurisdiction and our state partners to ensure that you know, everyone's in, in agreement, we looked internally that said, okay, what do you have uh, at the local jurisdictional level that can help offset this? And going back on what Ms. Camille was talking about is do we have services that we can utilize in-house that can count as cash, cash match basically, uh, to count towards the in-kind portion or the non-federal share portion? In this, in this specific instance, the local jurisdiction had two, uh, two engineers. And the description is, is, is a summation. There's a lot more to this. But the, the description talks a little bit about engineer one served as the project manager, oversee the completion of the project to make sure that what's being built is actually what was approved. Uh, look in and review any scope, scope changes and request changes. The second engineer, as you can see in the description, looks at more on the compliance side to make sure that, that the, uh, the end product is in compliance with uh, the permitting office, coordination with contractors, thing, things like that. At the end, when we totaled up all the dollar amounts, it was over $10,000 that the community did not have to put up in hard cash. They utilized their, their internal staff to come up with the over $10,000. But remember, like Ms. Camille's talked about, those tasks need to be directly related to the project itself, not their day-to-day, -day, but what's, what are they doing directly to support the project? So this was a win. It, it helped save the community over $10,000. The next activity, mitigation activity, I would like to talk about is a local mitigation planning or a local mitigation plan. Uh, we spoke about this a little bit earlier. And in a very overview, uh, we take our natural environment and put up with our built environment. We identify our risk and develop strategies to reduce or eliminate those risks. So, uh, and again, a mitigation plan is the foundation of the communities for long-term long strategies to reduce the repetitive cycle of disaster comes through have damage rebuild and then it rinse and repeat. We want to stop that cycle. So the mitigation planning is crucial for that, but also it's a prerequisite for our grant program. Uh, local jurisdiction must have an approved federal, um, federally approved local mitigation plan to apply for our grant programs. So it, it's a win-win. So when we look at how do we fund this, how do we ensure that our communities have a local mitigation plan? It's a 75-25 cost share. When we're looking at the top of the screen here, this is a uh, just a budget sample of what we typically see in a local mitigation plan. We have four or five uh, separate um, categories. We have to develop the application, um, the, the application itself. And then once we get that awarded, we have to develop the plan. And then there's some grants administration. So when we look at plan development, it's really critical that we have the local government involved in developing the plan because the local jurisdiction knows best what the risks are and potentially how, we, how do we mitigate those risks. So the bottom portion of that, if we look at those positions, we really need the emergency manager, the floodplain manager. A lot of those positions are going to be involved in the development of that mitigation plan at the local level to capture those hours, 
capture what they're doing to directly support that. As you can see here, the, the total number of hours add up really quickly. And when you add all those components together and all those positions together, that could come up to a large amount of money that's, that is not having to come out as hard cash that you can use as, as a soft match, if you will. Uh, so this greatly, re this is twofold. One, it greatly reduces the hard cost out of pocket, but it also incentivizes the local jurisdiction to be more involved in the application or the development of the plan itself. I would like to go over just a little bit on um, cost share ideas. Now, this is just ideas just to get them, uh, just to get the thought process going. Uh, like Ms. Camille talked about, we do have cash. Cash is always a good thing. But we also have staff time, like I just talked about, staff time, project management, financial services. The main thing I want you to take away, please, from this slide is the careful documentation. If staff are, are, are supporting a project, we just really need to document those times and document it well to ensure that whenever it comes time for reimbursement or it close out, then everything is documented in the process. And we go back to the uh, file of downloads. Uh, there's an HMA call share guide as well as an example of an in kind for your download. Uh, thank you guys so much for the time. Uh, I am proud to announce that uh, I'm excited to announce that I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Clay Lloyd from HUD, who is going to be talking about the Community Development Block Grant Program. Take it away, Mr. Clay. All right. Thank you, Marty. Appreciate that. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Clay Lloyd. I am a specialist in the Disaster and Special Issues Division at uh, HUD, and that's the division that administers the Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, as well as the Community Development Block Mitigation, or CDBG MIT. And I'll be presenting today on how to use CDBG funds as the FEMA program. So, uh, a quick overview of the process. We'll start by talking about what the CD pro CDBG program is, then go over the CDBG requirements for using those funds as non federal cost share. We'll discuss the entry points that you might be asking for how to explore the use of CDBG funds as the map for your program. Uh, we'll map out the process for setting up a non federal cost share program. We'll use CDBG DR, which is disaster, as an example. And then we'll look at an example of implementing the non -federal. So, uh, the first question that uh, you might be asking is um, who do I reach out to and, and what is uh, CDBG? So, CDBG stands for the Community Development Block Grant Program. And currently, there are a few different types of programs out there. Um, first, you have the original programs, the state CDBG program and the entitlement CDBG program. These are, have annual allocations every year um, that are given to the states are awarded to states who then uh, turn around and allocate them to local governments within their state. And then the entitlement program is a direct allocation on HUD to a local government, like a major city or urban area, for them to carry out their program. Um, the other program to think about is CDBG CV, CV program, which was created to support the recovery of communities from the effects of COVID-19. And it's an allocation that's passed through both the state and entitlement partners. Now, the last two uh, CDBG programs, the CDBG MIT program, which was created to support the building of mitigation measures for communities in the impacted and distressed areas resulting from major disasters between 2015 through 2017. I think uh, and those grantees are states and local governments recovering from Harvey, Irma, and Maria, as well as other major disasters. Um, and then also the CDBG DR program, Disaster Recovery. And this is the uh, HUD's longstanding disaster recovery program around since 2001 up until present. 
And um, whenever there's a major disaster declared in the uh, U.S., Congress usually uh, appropriates some CDBGDR money, which are then given to states and local governments after the major disaster to help in the recovery. And once again, the most impacted and distressed area. So those are the um, different CDBG programs that are out there. Um, I work once again on CDBGDR and CDBG MIP. We're using CDBGDR as an example when I talk about requirements. So the requirements between uh, each program uh, vary slightly, um, but overall they're, uh, they have the same goals. Um, I'm going to use, once again, CDBG disaster recovery. As an example, um, in CDBG DR, you'll uh, see that the award goes to the grantee, uh, who is either the state or the local government. So in the allocation for uh, CDBG DR funds, after Superstorm Sandy in 2012, um, both New York State and New York City received their own uh, allocations. So you can have um, both states or local governments receiving allocations. Um, the administration of the funds um, is done at the grantee level. So the grantee, whether state or local government, um, creates their action plan, decides which programs they're going to um, use these funds for in their action plan, select the eligible CDBG activities that are going to take place under that program, and then submit it to HUD. Um, the purpose of the funds are to develop viable communities. That's the uh, overall goal of CDBG program. And the objective, primary objective for CDBG is to develop these communities principally for low and moderate income persons. So uh, we have some requirements that are tied to low and moderate income objectives, which might be uh, different than what FEMA has. Um, the uh, grantees can take on a variety of eligible activities with the, the funding source. It's a very flexible source. Um, the, there are eligible activities in housing activities, like rehabilitation. There's uh, economic development activities like small business grants. There's infrastructure programs like public facility improvements, uh, as well as planning and public service. Uh, it's worth remembering that uh, CDBG funds, generally speaking, require 70% of the total award, awarded funds to benefit low moderate income households, which is unique compared to uh, FEMA, so keep that in mind. Uh, as you're thinking about your match program. Um, and let's go a level uh, below here now down to the requirements of an activity that is uh, doing CDBG non-federal cost. So um, an important thing to understand is non-federal cost share is an allowable payment under CDBG. Um, so that's not an activity in and of itself. It just says that payment of the non there is an allowable payment. So um, some things to remember is that uh, the CDBG funds that go towards the non-federal cost share for your FEMA program, um, those funds would, would uh, still need to be uh, CDBG program created that undertakes CDBG eligible activities that follows CDBG regulations, which include uh, Getting federal requirements taken where applicable, environmental review, public participation, others. Um, it needs to be uh, listed in the plan, uh, the CDBG plan, whether that's the action plan or the annual plan. And the costs um, that are used must be CDBG eligible costs or specifically the CDBG portion. Of um, the last thing is that after mentioning all these kind of requirements and how this is still a CDBG program, uh, is that um, it is um, possible and uh, it quite often can happen where the program administration of the program can be done by the FEMA applicant. Um, 
So um, while there's all these CD, uh, CDBG programs created, activities and eligible costs, the actual program administration for that portion of the fund can be undertaken by FEMA. And that's at, for an agreement with the, their state or local CDBG counterpart through a memorandum of understanding or subordinate agreement. Hey, Clay, it's Alex. I hate to interrupt. Uh, some folks are having trouble hearing you. Do you mind speaking up a little more? Sure. Yeah. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, let's talk about the entry point and the process, because I know a lot of you are probably asking yourselves, um, how would I actually go about starting this? Um, and the way that a, uh, a program like this uh, is set up is that uh, we start once again with the uh, new non-federal cost share CDBG activity and program being included uh, in an approved plan. So your uh, counterpart uh, at the state or local level who is the grantee um, would update their plan and include this new program. Um, another thing that is uh, started is went through your coordination with your local or state uh, counterpart uh, who's a CDBG grantee is you would write in the MOU or the subrecipient agreement. Uh, that's between you, the FEMA applicant or sub-applicant, and the CDBG grantee. Uh, that uh, memorandum of understanding um, designates the responsible entities for the pro program administration work, as well as an overview, budget, and any other requirements of the program. Um, the next part would be to uh, work together to develop your CDBG program policies and procedures. These would probably look very similar to the uh, FEMA policies and procedures that you will be creating. Uh, only modify to incorporate any uh, requirements, additional requirements uh, in regards to the CDBG. Um, you would also include an explanation of how you plan to meet the match, whether that's um, on an individual basis or, as mentioned previously, through a global match setup. Uh, and you also include procedures uh, for how to administer the program. And then the last uh, step in the process is if you are you the FEMA applicant or sub-applicant are the program administrator, uh, you would just follow your procedures that you helped write and the MOU or sub-recipient agreement. Um, and uh, as you are completing the program, you'll submit your documentation of eligible costs to your CDBG uh, state or local counterpart, the grantee who uh, would then uh, approve them and submit them to HUD to draw funds. So we had uh, a discussion of the entry point, uh, the coordination that's going on, the process. Uh, now we can kind of do a quick example of implementation. Um, the uh, example I'm gonna talk through um, is a, um, type of activity that's eligible under CDBG. Um, we call it a uh, voluntary uh, FIA program. Uh, FEMA, I, I believe, actually uh, prefers to call it a voluntary acquisition uh, program, but they're uh, very similar in that they buy uh, out homes in uh, flood, floodways, floodplains, and uh, uh, return them, demolish them, and return them to green space. Um, so you may be a grantee who has a, uh, several communities that you're going out to in your area um, to try to uh, in, uh, find several parcels that will be uh, purchased. Um, you will, uh, at the same time, have your CDBG version of the program um, that will probably, depending on what type of match you cho chose, uh, you chose a global match, you'll select a specific area and designate those people that apply to uh, apply at, to the CDBG program as CDBG uh, beneficiaries and applicants. Um, so uh, 
what you would do if you uh, were the theme as a FEMA applicant or sub applicant, you would run your program, your CDBG program, in a similar way to as you would uh, your, FEMA, uh, your FEMA program. First, you would establish that MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, a partnership with your counterpart, who's a CDBG grantee. Uh, your counterpart would uh, write an amendment to their action plan or their annual plan, including this program and the amounts uh, under the program. Together, you develop policies and procedures, and then you begin program administration. So you would uh, reach out to your community. You'd identify select your interested parcel. Uh, you would still go through procurement for work. Uh, procurement uh, requirements under HUD and CDBG are slightly different, so it'll be um, a little different uh, for those applicants and when you're using those funds. Um, You'll do uh, uh, title work, environmental review, and demo. Um, you'll conduct environmental review on the parcels. Uh, you'll go to closing and close on the acquisition uh, with the beneficiaries on the sale of the property. And then you'll demolish uh, the uh, property and return it to uh, green state. And all along that time, you are documenting costs and submitting them to the CDBG grantee your state or local counterpart for reimbursement. So uh, one of the last things I want to talk about um, is why an MOU or a subrecipient agreement, why do we, uh, why does HUD CDBG uh, require this? Why can't we just give the money directly to the FEMA sub-applicant or applicant? Um, reason is HUD uh, considers its designated grantees this department as the responsible entity. Um, so it is responsible for the money that we allocate to them and award to them. Um, and that includes uh, the overall management of the funds and monitoring to see that all the regulations are implemented uh, correctly. So uh, any partnership uh, where program administration and implementation is passed off uh, to another department, including a FEMA applicant or sub applicant. Uh, would require a formal agreement to ensure the roles and responsibilities are clearly delineated between the two groups. Um, a lot of people ask, they might not have done an MOU or a subsidy agreement, or they've done it in their capacity with FEMA funds, but they're not sure uh, what it looks like uh, with HUD and CDBG funds. Um, generally speaking, they all uh, have the same uh, parts. Uh, the, uh, Contents of an MOU or subrecipient agreement would include the award amount, the goals, the objectives, scope of work, budget, program costs, performance, metrics, what you're going to document, and the CDBG federal cost. Um, great. So, um, what is the next step? Let's say you're interested in uh, partnering with and kind of getting to know your state or local counterpart who has these CDBG funds. Um, where do you go? Where do you learn more? Um, what resources uh, can you explore? Uh, we have a list here. Um, the first one is the uh, kind of portal to uh, HUD's CDBG uh, website. It has rules, regulations, requirements, for all types of CDBG information. Um, and then the next four bullets are how to look up your company. Because a lot of you are gonna be, uh, learn a lot more as you start your conversation with the uh, state or local uh, CDBG grantee. So there's a grantee lookup for uh, the CDBG disaster recovery and mitigation funds. There's a lookup for state funds, for entitlement and CD funds. Um, and the last bullet point there is an example, a PowerPoint, that goes into more detail of the example I gave earlier on what a voluntary acquisition by program looks like with CDBG funds. Um, and then lastly, before I pass it off, I just put this on another slide because this is brand new October 2020 guidance that FEMA and HUD collaborated on. And that's guidance on non-federal cost share on the FEMA public assistance side, um, and the HUD specifically our CDBG disaster recovery fund. 
Uh, now, although that's not a one-to-one -one, uh, guidance tool, it is brand new and it talks about all the things that we talked about. I think it would be extremely beneficial to kind of look at it and get an understanding of how that partnership is created for your FEMA HMA. So that is it for me. Um, now I am going to uh, turn it over to Steve Kraut from City Tech Strategy Group, who will talk more about uh, readiness for resilience. Steve, if you're ready, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Clay, and thank you to all those joining the webinar today. Uh, I have the great pleasure uh, serving as project manager to the Readiness for Real Resilience program. This is a uh, program inspired initially by a Qualcomm grant uh, that is dedicated to serving the needs of communities in Texas and Puerto Rico impacted by Hurricanes Harvey and Maria, become better prepared for, better able to respond to, and ultimately better able to recover from the next storm. And I will say we are thrilled to see FEMA release its new BRIC program uh, dedicated to helping communities uh, bolster their pre-mitigation activities. And if your community is interested in participating in the BRIC program, I hope my experience through the Readiness for Resilience program can lend some guidance in setting up the best partnership for you and your community. So as you are considering what type of partnership to put together, I think it's worth taking a look at the guiding principles of the BRIC program. And a few key words stick out to me. Capability and capacity building. Encouraging and enabling innovation. Promoting partnerships. Enabling large projects. Maintaining flexibility. And providing consistency. These are all important goals that you should keep in mind as you're developing your partnership. And when we were developing the Readiness for Resilience program, we were first and foremost interested in focusing on what we believe to be the three key pillars of enhancing uh, resilient infrastructure, and that being uh, working with local communities directly, uh, energy, and telecommunications. If you don't have those three fundamental core capabilities, uh, it makes it very difficult ultimately to enhance the infrastructure. So we were, as I mentioned earlier, very fortunate to have an initial grant uh, from Qualcomm. And of course, they are one of the uh, world-class uh, leading providers of wireless to telecommunications uh, infrastructure. So they brought tremendous expertise to the table. The Smart Cities Council is another partner of ours that has a long history working with cities as a technology neutral and trusted advisor to cities. The Business Council for Sustainable Energy is a clean energy trade association based here in Washington, D.C. with a wealth of industry and market experience that can be shared as communities are looking for energy uh, alternatives. And then finally, the National Association of State Energy Officials that are typically governor-appointed energy officials tasked with developing state energy plans and strategies. So that made up the core uh, partnership. Uh, beyond that, of course, we wanted to focus on the correct uh, local partners in both Texas and Puerto Rico. And interestingly enough, in Texas, the governor made what I think is a really wise choice appointing Texas A&M AgriLife School as the lead of the recovery effort. And the AgriLife School actually has people on the ground in virtually every county in Texas. So the governor wanted somebody, an organization that had a feel for what the communities needed. Uh, and of course, he established a governor's commission to rebuild Texas, consisting of a number of stakeholder experts that would facilitate uh, workshops around the state uh, uh, to come up with recovery recommendations. The Texas Community Watershed Partners uh, has a wealth of flood mitigation uh, research uh, that uh, we could rely on during this process. And in Puerto Rico, we partnered with the government of Puerto Rico itself. So that made up the core 
um, a partnership of the program and then uh, also the local partners. The Readiness Resilience uh, Program itself really is a technology-neutral trusted advisor forum for resilient stakeholders, consisting of three main phases. Number one, a discovery phase. We want to go directly to the impacted local communities and hear from them about what they view their pre-mitigation and rebuilding needs are. From that learning experience, we then bring experts from industry uh, to make best practice and technology recommendations that could apply to the needs identified uh, by the local communities and build what's called a resilience roadmap. And finally, that roadmap contains actual rebuilding proposals that are community-based projects, recommendations for public-private partnerships, and potentially available funding sources. And ultimately, that led, led to this great chart behind me that I don't know if you can see too well, but that is a, a one piece of the roadmap. And you'll see that that includes some of the needs identified by the local communities, some of the best practice technology solutions um, that were paired to those, the project recommendations. And then we actually took our recommendations and compared them to the governor's commission's uh, report to see if there was consistency among those two. So we feel that um, if you go back to the guidance principles, this program did enable capacity building. Uh, it encouraged certainly innovation uh, and, uh, and ultimately um, we wanted to lead to project development. So the question today, of course, is if you're applying for these federal grants and there is a 25% cost share requirement, how can you and your community meet that requirement? We did not have any federal funding uh, in this go-around of, of the Readiness for Resilience program, but we think that the program is applicable as an example. And so there are a few ways here that we were able to not only um, get the grant funding from Qualcomm, uh, but then um, sort of capture the available resources from the other organizations. So I list a few of these here just um, as examples on how you might meet your match. Um, the grant funding is critical. Uh, we're always on the, uh, on the lookout for that. But Qualcomm provided a, a wealth of technical expertise. Uh, they contributed to the management of the program and the planning and strategy. Smart Cities Council uh, has Smart Cities best practices that they could bring to the table. They actually brought member companies, experts from around the country to contribute. Uh, they have uh, smart technology data, uh, workshop guides, uh, road mapping expertise, uh, and then they have an online um, uh, tool called Activator that enables communities to collaborate even in a COVID environment. Um, the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, I mentioned, brings a wealth of uh, clean energy uh, expertise and best practices and project uh, examples. And then finally, NASIO brought planning, strategy, governance, technical expertise, and down the line. Texas A&M uh, has, I mentioned the AgriLife School, um, has what they call strike teams. And these are the folks that are out there in the community. So we were able to rely on them uh, to get the right people to the table. They were able to donate uh, facilities in which we could hold the conferences and the workshops and the roadmap building. Um, the Governor's Commission uh, was key in providing um, what they learned in terms of planning and strategy and road mapping. And then I mentioned the Texas Community Watershed Partners that has all sorts of flood mitigation uh, research uh, available that we could draw upon. So those are resources that we could potentially use if we were to apply for a federal grant and help us meet that 25% uh, cost share. Um, I just want to mention a couple things here. We've always used a smart cities approach uh, in this effort, and that really gets to that core principle of, of promoting innovation. And so when we were working with, with communities, we encouraged them not only to look at their direct community needs, 
but look across the border to the counties adjacent to them and see what their needs may be um, or, or, or what some of their um, uh, potential um, barriers and problems might be. For example, there were two counties uh, located next to each other and one had to um, drain its reservoir because of the massive rainfall. Uh, the county just below it was not alerted in advance, and so as the water was coming down, it was actually flooding some of the evacuation routes. So if there had been planning amongst those two communities, the adjacent communities, that situation could be avoided um, uh, immediately and then certainly down the road. Um, the critical point here, again, is funding and financing. How are we going to meet that cost share? So I mentioned earlier, you know, through these public-private partnerships, if you're, if you're partnering with multi-entities, uh, uh, you have an ability to actually stack financing approaches and meet that cost share. Um, bring them all together uh, under a single um, uh, umbrella. Some of these other bullet points um, are more directed towards uh, project development itself rather than the cost share. Uh, I'm going to wrap up just by mentioning we have um, a number of resources that you can take away from this slide uh, that, that examine best practices that could be utilized in resilience, smart cities, uh, and, and public-private partnerships. And with that, I'm going to pass it uh, to Ryan Janda, Chief of Non-Disaster Grants Implementation, uh, who will guide our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, if everybody can turn on your camera again so we can have the multi-screen, that'd be great. There's Clay, Brandon, and Steve. Thank you, guys. Um, what, a, what, a great, um, what, a, what a great session today. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you, Steve. Um, um, and, you know, just really good information on, on, on your program. Um, that was such helpful information by our panelists, Brandon, Anna. Um, Anna's not on the screen because we're not going to have a question for Anna right now. Um, Camille, Marty, Clay, um, thank you for participating today. And as a final part of our session, we'll be taking an opportunity to ask a few questions. Um, the first question is going to go to Brandon Suiza from FEMA, our FMA section chief. Brandon, good afternoon, and thank you for the information you provided earlier. The question we have for you, Brandon, is can you tell us if there is a way to reduce the cost share to 90-10? That's a great question, Ryan. And uh, in the FMA program, we get it all the time uh, because we have varied cost shares, as I pointed out. Currently, though, all of the cost shares that are established are established um, per statute, per regulation. So we don't have any flexibility in adjusting those cost shares outside of what has been described today. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I'm going to be trying, I'll try to be smart enough to mute my phone as you guys start talking so I can reduce the feedback. Um, the next question goes to Camille, Camille, the BRIC section chief. Um, I think many of our listeners are excited about the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, Camille. I hear it time and time and time again. Um, can you tell us when the cost share resources have to be identified? Sure. And let me just say, Ryan, I'm equally excited about the BRIC program. It's been um, something we've been very hard in the works for for quite a while. So that's a really good question, Ryan. We talked about what the cost shares are. We talked about all these sources. When do you have to have them lined up? And that's in the time of application. So as part of your application, as you're putting that together, you're going to be identifying what is that, for example, 75% cost share, and you don't have to, you just say FEMA out beside it. Um, but then you have that 25% cost share, and you're going to need to identify where it's coming from and how it's coming. So, for example, if it's just one organization and it's cash, then that's pretty much it, and you just identify that source and it's cash. But if you're doing like we talked about where you're packaging several different cost shares together, you're going to need to be able to spell out, okay, this is my total 25, but as I showed in that example with the um, one property acquisition and there had three different cost shares, 
So they divided out, here are the three different um, sources, I should say, not cost shares, the three different sources, and here's the dollar value of each. In total, or adding all those all up, they equal 25%. You're also going to be need to be able to show that there's a commitment from that, that you have those, those funds or those resources available. That way we have um, some understanding that if this grant is approved, you actually have that cash, or you actually are going to be able to get those sources. So that is something that's done at time of application. Thank you, Camille. Marty, the next question goes to you, and, and thank you for joining us today. It's nice to see you, um, and we really appreciate your partnership um, with, with Region 6, um, with you know, several of us from FEMA headquarters. You know, it does take a village to implement hazard mitigation assistance. Marty, the question for you is, how do I document my in-kind contributions, and is there a tool out there we can use? That's a good question, Ryan, and that, that's something we work through uh, a, a lot together. And uh, like we've talked about on, on numerous occasions on this webinar, early communication, early coordination, that's the key. Uh, in, the download, uh, in the downloaded file download section, uh, there's the call share guide that I mentioned, but there's also a spreadsheet. It's called the in-kind examples. That is just to get the conversation started. Uh, that's the starting point. If you're a local community or a, a county or a parish, have those conversations with your with your state agency or your recipient. If you're a state agency, let's have those conversations up and down the uh, the chain, so we can all have a better understanding of what why we're doing what we're doing. So to start the conversation is like we talked about. If uh, I believe Ms. Camille talked about it, and what if someone is doing something in kind, it has to be directly related to the project. So in that spreadsheet, there's a description, it's called task. So this keeps people describe the task, who is doing it, what are they doing, why are they doing it? Uh, so to document the end kind uh, is early coordination and communication uh, with your federal and state partners and your local partners, but also making sure we document everything exactly. We don't want, we, that, that helps in many different aspects. One, when we get to close out, hopefully 36 months from award, uh, it's an easy closeout, right, because everything's documented. Uh, and the person who started that may not be there 36 months later. They may have accepted the award, won the, uh, may have, uh, may have you know, moved on, won the lottery, uh, moved to Bahamas, who knows. But the documentation needs to be there. Uh, secondary, that key, it's a fundamental thing is that if we have the description, that also helps us stay on task and prevent scope creep. Uh, so the, the document in there, uh, in kind examples, it's a spreadsheet, it's a starter, but the main thing to take away is the early communication and coordination, sir. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, so now, Clay. Um, Clay, I really appreciated listening to your presentation on the Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, we at FEMA have heard time and time again how it can be used as a cost share for um, HMA projects and sub-applications. So listening it from CDBG's mouth, I think is really, really important for our stakeholders. Um, so so th just, just thank you very much for being part of today. Um, the question for you, Clay, is can you tell us when is the best time to connect with my state local counterpart who manages CDBG program funds? Yeah, thank you, Ryan, uh, for the question. Uh, the, like uh, Marty just mentioned, I'm going to reiterate it. Uh, if you're interested uh, in tips for the cultural components, if you're interested on the CDBG side, it's also uh, best to reach out as soon as possible um, and as early on in the process. The two kind of main examples I usually mention um, is FEMA projects might start going through procurement without considering consideration for the CDBG uh, requirements, and then uh, procurement uh, contracts might need to be amended, or you might need to go through the entire procurement process again for the CDBG portion. Um, the other reason is uh, reaching out early to a CDBG key um, provides you, you know, an increased chance of them having available funds if they haven't already committed somewhere else. For those two reasons, reach out as soon. Thanks, Clay. Um, when, when we ask the next question, if you guys could all just get a little closer to your microphone so we can hear you just a little bit better. 
So the next question I'm going to ask each of our panelists here, um, because Marty is in the upper left-hand corner, and that's the way my brain works right now, um, it might work differently after COVID is over, but for right now, that is the way it works. Um, Marty, here's the question for you. What is the one thing you think our attendees should take away from today's conversation? The one thing that I think everyone should take away is if there's a mitigation action that, that the community feels is really needed and the cost share is, a, is the inhibiting factor, work together with other partners, work together with, uh, with your state and local partners and see if there's a way to strategize to offset that hard cash so that way it's, it's not an impediment. It's not, um, we can get to good mitigation done without having to worry about the hard cash. Uh, let that come later. Let's worry about the, uh, the mitigation actions and how we can better protect our communities. Thanks a lot, Marty. You know, I got too excited about the one panel question for everybody that I've missed Steve. Steve, I want to bring you back in here really quick. And I really apologize for that. Um, I thought your presentation was very insightful, Steve. Um, so let, let's go back to that for just a second. Um, the question for you, Steve, is can you tell us how um, do you meet the 25% cost share requirement absent a significant cash or grant contribution? And then we'll come back around to the other panelists. Thanks, Steve. Well, that's the challenge for all of us, right? Um, you know, we were very fortunate to have an initial grant from Qualcomm. And like I mentioned, we're always looking for grants. And whether that comes from a big corporate um, entity or whether from, you know, a, a foundation or a nonprofit, um, that's going to be, you know, extremely helpful as, a, as sort of a cash contribution. But then I think, and I really like FEMA's um, approach on making sure that we're promoting public-private partnerships because you're bringing more people to the table here. And if you're inventive, if you're creative, you will realize that these entities all have significant value that you may not even be aware of, but through the conversations and asking them to join, you can realize that, oh, wow, um, you have done a lot of research in this area. Um, maybe you can tweak it to our particular community needs in this project. Um, Texas A&M is a classic example. You know, big universities have so many resources. They actually have, you know, these strike teams on the ground, right, that we could utilize. There wasn't, um, uh, it didn't take a big ramp up in order to get personnel out to the local communities. Uh, we had um, the benefit of Smart Cities Council that has worked closely with cities and communities that could bring all of their expertise and, and workshop sheets and, and, and fine tune it to the task at hand. Um, the National Association of State Energy Officials, um, you know, they're already working with state governors uh, to develop these um, state energy strategies. So just with our conversations amongst the, amongst the partners, we were able to come up with resources to meet needs that were far beyond that we have envisioned just with a Qualcomm grant. And so um, just be creative and talk to your partners. I think that's fantastic advice, and that's something you'll see when you're looking at the BRIC, um, the BRIC criteria, too. And I think also the criteria for the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program and Community Flood Mitigation Projects is increased cost share and in, in showing that private-public partnership is a very important um, aspect of those programs. Um, thanks a lot, Steve. So my, my, my favorite question, we're going to get back to it now, but you're next up on the list. Um, so if we were to take away, if we were to, if we were to have one takeaway from you um, on the topic of cost share, what would it be? Great. Uh, can you hear me right now? I'm just going to test because I know I wasn't coming through. Great. Um, uh, so my one, my one big takeaway is um, it can be done. Um, oftentimes your uh, state or local grantee office is very receptive. Uh, they would love to uh, be a part of a story of increasing resilience in their communities. Um, so these are um, opportunities for them to come in together, uh, leveraging each other's resources and funds uh, to uh, get projects off the ground that might not have been uh, available if the CDBG part doesn't come in. So definitely 
Um, it's a great opportunity, and when you talk to them, uh, usually they're receptive to uh, partnering. Hey, thanks, Clay. That's really good advice. Camille, now, now for you, what is the one thing you think our attendees should take away from today's conversation? Well, let me start by Ryan is they've all stole my answers and my backup answers. So I'm going to echo everything that Steve, Clay, and Marty have said. Um, I've been doing mitigation for a lot of years. Um, I don't want to say it's 20 plus now at this point. Um, but one thing I know, and I've worked in a lot of different roles, including um, on the ground helping communities put projects together. And one of the things I always talk to them about is don't let your lack of cash keep you from putting in a project or doing these mitigation things that are really going to save so much in the long run for your community. Which the whole reason we had today is we know there are situations throughout our country right now where places are cash strapped. But there's still, you know, hurricanes are going on right now. The, the natural ha disasters don't stop um, because of other situations that are going on. And so there's the continued need for resiliency and for natural hazard mitigation in this country. And so we want, we want everyone to um, be, as we say in the BRIC program, innovative or creative in how you come up with match too. Don't let your lack of cash um, be, prohibit you from trying to find other sources. And I really appreciate what Steve is talking about with partnership because that's really key. And you're right, Ryan, um, thank you for pointing out that that's one of the six guiding principles of BRIC is promoting partnerships because we have, and we talk about shared responsibility in our program too. We know that one grant program um, and single um, parties cannot do get everything done that needs to be done. And so you'll see in our competition for um, criteria for BRIC, we are really rewarding that leveraging of partnership. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that would be my one takeaway. Thanks, Camille. Brandon, question goes to you. What is the one thing you think our attendees should take away from today's conversation? That you guys have really not left me with very much. Everybody's really covered everything, but um, ultimately, you know, I've I've had experience in local government up through FEMA, and I've seen a lot of projects that look like they weren't going to come through, especially because of Match. But my advice is just to never give up and be determined. If you really have an awesome mitigation project then you know those forces are going to align behind you and so just keep moving forward there's so many different ways to do it contact you know uh, with our mitigation programs your state hazard mitigation officer is a wealth of resources look for champions right so look for other communities that have gotten great mitigation done um, you will find weird sources for cost match sometimes that that will rise up and you know sometimes states do chip in there's a host of different offices within the states that could be also unearthed. Um, and because we do accept, you know, uh, different types of match, there's just, an, you know, almost an infinite amount of sources that you can come through. And I think Steve really also emphasized that, you know, private partnerships are also a great opportunity to be able to get um, matched because that our, um, you know, our economic sector has uh, interest in making sure that uh, the, the country is running. So just never give up and always look for champions would be uh, a key thing, so. That's good solid advice, Brandon. Steve, the, the last question goes to you. And I think your previous, your previous question and answer, I thought hit it out of the park. I'm not asking you to repeat yourself, but that, that was a good one. So the question, Steve, just as a reminder is, uh, what is the one thing you think that our attendees should take away from today's conversation? Well, thanks, Ryan. And um, I would say think globally, act locally, and be inclusive. Remember, the mission here is to help those communities that were impacted by natural disaster. So you need to be acting locally, but you need to be thinking globally by bringing in experts from around the country, around the world, because these communities don't always have that expertise or the available resources. And then finally, we need to make certain that we're inclusive uh, to the vulnerable population, populations um, in the development of all pre-mitigation uh, planning and strategies. 
So thank you, Ryan. No, thank thank you, Steve. That was that was really 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 helpful. Um, so we're going to close up our webinar today. Um, thank you, Steve, for answering the final question, um, and thank you to all of our presenters today, um, and to all of you that are attending our our webinar. Thank you for joining us. We know that your time is valuable. We know you have a lot going on in your neck of the woods. Um, so just we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, you now have a polling question in front of you. We appreciate your feedback here so that we can um, learn more about what you thought of this webinar. Um, and your, your feedback is really important to us so that we know how to, how to frame these things up in the future. It also tells us where you're from. If you're from a nonprofit organization, a federal, another federal agency, they're from state or local government. So these are good, good pieces of information for us to, to just track some metrics. So before you close up today, um, please uh, just take a moment, answer our polling questions. And um, I just want to say again, thank you very much for your time. Um, and, and have yourselves a great day. Thank you all very much.